In this episode, we are going to look at the dark room side of Darktable 3.8, as that applies to a new user who just wants to get up and running. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to take two of episode 106 for Understanding Darktable. I did actually record 106 on the same day that I recorded 105, but when I came to edit it, I realized I'd covered a lot of stuff that wasn't relevant to new users, and I'd left out some stuff that was important, so I'm doing it again. Okay, so we've got these half dozen images that I shot in my backyard last week, and if we want to start processing any one of these images, you can simply double click on it to load that image in the darkroom view. So we jump over to the darkroom and we'll start with the thumbnail up in the top left hand corner. That thumbnail will always be there and show you the full version of the image, even if in the main editing part of the UI you've zoomed in on your image. And you'll see in the thumbnail that the rest that's hidden gets dimmed and just what you're viewing is still at full luminosity. You can left click anywhere in that thumbnail to jump around within the image. So if you have zoomed in, but you think, oh, I just want to check out that part down there, you can simply click and jump to that area of the image. Snapshots. This is important. If you are coming from Adobe Lightroom, the snapshots in Darktable do not work the way you might expect them to. It's not like take a copy of the entire history state so if I stuff everything else up by tweaking things I can simply jump back to that snapshot or that moment in time. That is not the way snapshots work in Darktable. The way these snapshots work is that they simply capture a bitmap image of the way your image looks at a given point in time and you can then use that to compare as you start making changes to the processing of the image. But they do not allow you to get back to where you were at the point when the snapshot was taken. I've covered that in another video, so I'm not going to labor the point right now, but just be aware that that is the case. The history stack. Again, trap for new users. You import a raw file, you open it in the darkroom view, and you see that there are suddenly, you know, 13 or 14 history states in the history stack. And again, this is something that confuses new users. They go, why are there all of these things? Remember in the last episode, I, you know, brought up the analogy of the sports car with the Perspex hood, and you can sort of see inside, you can see everything that's going on. And I said, Darktable does this, it shows you everything. This is what I mean. All of those history states, or certainly the first 10 of them, are things that every other piece of image editing software that handles raw files, they all do all of those things. They just don't necessarily show you in the history stack within those other applications. It's all happening. It's just hidden from the user. With Darktable, it's all there out in the open for you to see. Don't be stressed by it. It's just all of the things that need to happen with a raw file in order to display an image on your screen. Like, you know, a raw black and white point. Demosaicing needs to be applied to the raw data. An input color profile and an output color profile both need to be applied in order to display the image. Right, and we could go on, but you get the idea. These things all have to happen with every image. Now, if you load a JPEG, you will notice that this history stack is much shorter. It'll probably be only four or five steps. But again, they are things that have to happen in order for Darktable to display the image to you on your computer monitor. Don't stress. The pixel pipe. This is a term you will hear as you spend more time with Darktable, and it refers to the order of operations as you are processing an image. And when we look at these module groups over here, and I'll get to module groups later on, but this first group here show only active modules. That is a representation of the pixel pipe in action, and it works from the bottom to the top. And essentially what it means is that 
all of the processing modules within Darktable all have a predefined place at which their code is implemented on the image that you are processing. So if we look at, say, Filmic RGB, we can see that that's right at the end of the pixel pipe, although we could activate other modules that have a later priority. Even if Filmic was the very first thing you started tweaking, so in your mind, it was the first thing that you did, the actual processing of the code for Filmic RGB happens after all of these other things have happened. So even if you make an alteration to Filmic RGB, that alteration always happens at the end of all of the processing of the other modules. Don't Again, don't get too hung up on this. Just understand that it is the way Darktable works. It took me a little bit of wrapping my head around it at first, but you, you come to realize that there are smarter heads than you and I have worked all this stuff out and have worked out why the order of processing is important. You can muck around with that order, but as a new user, I would caution you against doing that. Believe me, the people who've worked this out know what they're talking about and it's there and it's set for a reason. Creating a style from the history stack. This little icon at the bottom left corner of the history uh, module will allow you to create a style. And in Darktable parlance, a style is essentially a bunch of module processing commands that you might want to save and reuse on other images. So if you want to create you know, a series of images that have a consistent look, you know, it might be that you want to make them all black and white and you might want to put a frame around them and you might want to do you know, any number of things. All of those sequences of events can be saved as a style. So if you have done some things within the history of this particular image and you want to save that as a style, you can do that from this button. Again, it's been covered in another video, so I'm not going to do it now. The histogram. The histogram up here has multiple different views. And again, I've covered this in another video, but you can click on these icons to change the style of the histogram. You can choose whether you want a linear or a logarithmic display, and you can activate or deactivate certain color channels. Now we get onto the module groups. If we click on the hamburger icon on the right hand side here, you'll see there's a bunch of different module presets here. We can click on modules all, and that will show us all of the modules that exist within Darktable. Just a quick diversion. You'll notice that to move up and down this list, you need to get your mouse over this scroll bar and drag up and down. However, there is a keyboard shortcut, and that is Control Alt, and that will allow you to mouse over the middle of the modules and simply scroll your mouse wheel to run up and down the list of modules that are on display. Okay, getting back to the module groups, you will notice that there is a default modules preset, and every time you change one of these presets, you'll notice that the icons here change. For most of them, you will always see the show active modules group, uh, and then there will be other options. Deprecated refers to the fact that there are certain modules within Darktable that have been relegated to the sidelines because the code is not particularly well implemented. Those modules, if they have been deprecated, it is because they have been replaced with something better. I would recommend that you look at the workflow scene referred preset. Display referred and scene referred, again, is the topic of another video that I've previously done. Definitely go and have a look at that. Scene referred is what we want to be using going forward. However, I've created my own preset group, which I've called Bruce. If you want to get into that, you can do it through the Manage Presets option, which will launch this window. Again, I've covered that in another video, but at least understand that that is there. So I want to go back to my Bruce preset and that will load these groups that I've saved, a base group, a tone group, a color group, a corrections group, and an effects group, and of course the 
show active modules. Now you will notice that through some of these presets, there is also this icon for the quick access panel. The quick access panel is essentially cut down versions of some of the modules that you will probably want to reach for as you are just starting your Darktable journey. So things like Filmic RGB, it's just giving you the three basic sliders that you will use most of the time. Within Color Balance RGB, again, it's the three sliders you'll use most of the time. So these are the modules you'll probably start with a lot. Now, one thing I noticed as I was recording the first incarnation of this video was that the local contrast module is included in the quick access panel. And I did wonder about why that was the case, because the local contrast module does not use a scene referred algorithm. It is a display referred, which is the old technology that we're trying to move away from. And I thought to myself, I wonder why it's still in the quick access panel. And then it occurred to me, for people coming over from Adobe Lightroom, the local contrast module is the closest thing to your clarity slider. And I know when I was using Lightroom, the clarity slider was always something that you reached for because it just made every image look amazing. So. By all means, use it, but use it with discretion. Don't go overboard. The, the short version of display referred versus scene referred is that display referred is non-linear, scene referred is linear, and you will find that when you mouse over any module, you get a pop-up and the input line will tell you whether this module works as linear or non-linear. Don't want to get sidetracked down that rabbit hole. Again, I've covered that in another video. Okay, so getting back to the quick access panel, you will find that in the top right hand corner of each of these is this little icon that says go to the full version of whatever module you've moused over. So if you want to jump to the full version of the Filmic module, you can simply click on that and boom, here you are in the Filmic RGB module with all of the you know, various parameters that are available for tweaking from that module. Down here in the bottom left hand corner, you will find another hamburger that says quick access to presets. Now, understand that this only refers to presets which you have created, not the presets which come already built into Darktable. Beside that, you will find the styles button. So if you have saved any styles, they will appear as a pop-up list here, and you can simply select a style to have it applied to the image you are currently working on. If you have a second monitor, you can display a second darkroom image window on your second monitor with this button right here. In the middle here, you've got pertinent information that is extracted from the EXIF metadata for this image, and you can edit what image information is displayed here through the preferences. Again, I've covered that in a previous video, so I'll let you explore that on your own. Down here in the bottom right-hand corner, we have a whole bunch of icons. We have the focus peaking display. That will show you which pixels in the image are in focus. Next up, we've got the color assessment conditions. This is really handy for setting the black and white point and the amount of contrast in your image. It simply displays a white border around your image so that you're not distracted by editing in a really dark room or editing in an overly bright room. Next, we've got a raw overexposed indicator. This will simply display a hash up here. You can see it in the top right hand corner. That tells me that within the raw data, there is some clipping. In this particular image, it's not overly out of control. It's enough that I could actually save it with some processing, but that will simply display any clipping that exists in the raw data. Next to that is your standard over and under exposed indicator, which will take into account any processing you've done with modules within Darktable. I always check my images for over and under exposure before I export them so that I know I'm not exporting an image that's got a massive amount of clipping in it. You've then got soft proofing, a gamut check so you can check to see if you've cranked up your saturation way too far. 
then pixels are going to be out of gamut. I recommend that you don't do that, but that's up to you. And then finally, a grid overlay. Now, pretty much all of these you can right click on to get access to more information or more control over how these particular indicators work. So if I was to go to a module like Color Zones, which does actually have some presets stored, they will appear under that hamburger menu. You can create any preset you like by, you know, dialing in whatever settings you want and then clicking on the hamburger and going store new preset. There is also a reset button on every module. So if you've mucked around with the parameters and you suddenly think, no, this is not what I wanted, click on reset and that will reset the module back to its default state. Then there is a multiple instance action button. This allows you to create duplicates of any given module a little bit outside the scope of what I'm trying to do with this video, so I will leave that for another time. You can investigate it for yourself. Anywhere you see a slider like this, there are multiple ways to interact with it. You can left click and drag. You can also do what I call wag the dog, which is right click on the slider. And then you will get this pop up diagram and it works like this. If you bring your mouse down to the bottom of this graph, you will get very fine control of that parameter as you swipe your mouse from left to right. As you move your mouse up this graph, you get much more coarse adjustment. I really like this. I've never seen it in any other software and I find it really handy. You'll also notice when you right click that you get a little flashing icon on the right hand side. It disappears the moment you move your mouse. But at any time, if you want to enter an exact value, let's say I wanted to set this mix at 15%. I can just type in 15, press enter, and now I've got that exact value for that particular slider. If you want to reset the slider back to its default value, you can simply double click on it and it will go back to its default, whatever that default value is. All right, I am going to leave it there. I know I barreled through that pretty fast and I know I referenced a lot of prior videos. You'll just need to use the search bar on my channel on YouTube and search for the things you want a bit more information on. If I tried to cover everything in detail again, we would be here for hours. So hopefully this has just given you the basics so you can get up and running, start processing your images and exporting them and posting them to social media or putting them on your phone or creating a slideshow of desktop images for your computer or whatever it is that you want to do with your images. All right. Again, welcome to the channel. I hope you hang around and uh, if you have questions, comments or feedback, please sing out in the comments down below. I do make an effort to at least respond to the first interaction of every comment on my channel. Uh, if you come back and reply to my reply, I don't get a notification about that. So sometimes I don't always see that you've come back with another comment, but I will always try and interact as much as I can. All right. Good to have you here. I hope you enjoy Darktable and I will catch you in the next one.